Hi everyone, welcome to introductory Python tutorials with a special focus on image processing related tasks. If you haven't already subscribed to this channel, please go ahead and do that right now. Until now, in the last uh, half a dozen videos or even more, we have been working with uh, units, primarily with 2D datasets. Now, what to do if you have a 3D dataset? One way you can segment 3D dataset is by just looking at one 2D slice at a time training a 2D unit and then uh, predicting one 2D slice at a time and putting the volume together, which works fine in most cases, but it may not be the ideal choice for uh, a lot of 3D datasets. Why? Because uh, you probably need information from the plane above or a few planes above and a few planes below uh, to properly segment something on a given, uh, on a given plane. So, 3D unit can uh, allow you or it enables you to work with 3D kernels that gets you information, feature information in a uh, 3D sense. Like instead of just three by three kernel, like one 2D kernel, all we need to do to work with 3D unit is just change that to three by three by three. So you get like features in three dimensional. That's, that's literally it. So let's understanding what uh, you know, 3D datasets are and what, uh, how do you build 3D unit and then jump into code and segment a 3D dataset. So starting with understanding what is 3D data. I am sure you're watching this video because you probably want to segment 3D data and you probably know what 3D dataset is. It is a dataset that is, uh, that represents a region of interest in three dimensions and that data set can be acquired using many techniques it can even be single slice by slice technique where you put everything together registering the slices and all that stuff but it doesn't matter what we're talking about is volumetric data where it's not just one 2d slice anymore now these can be like i just mentioned you can get this data from uh, quite a few techniques out there uh, one being uh, MRI imaging, for example, especially in this bio uh, field, MRI can be quite uh, common, right? I mean, to get your entire volume. And it can also be from CT, like tomography, whether it is uh, industrial tomography or uh, micro tomography or even X-ray microscopy, okay, which is by Zeiss uh, uh, Versa X-ray microscopes that offer high resolutions uh, you know, for, for, for your, uh, for your, uh, you know, from your samples. So, uh, this is another technique like CT and another technique is uh, FIBSAM. This is where you're not uh, collecting this volumetric information, but you're collecting one 2D slice at a time and you're actually putting all these uh, together. So you get a bigger volume. A good example here is if you look at the top row right there, this is a uh, X-ray microscope image of what looks like a uh, oil and gas like shale rock. Okay, so this is a small piece of ro this rock and you have a uh, tomography image or uh, X-ray microscope image or a volume right there. And then you say, okay, want a smaller volume from here to be imaged at even higher resolution. So you switch from uh, X-ray microscope to a FIBSAM, focused ion beam scanning electron microscope. From Zeiss, it's called cross beam. And then you switch the technique and then now you get really high resolution images down to sub nanometer scale. And now you start to see the features. For example, there is this organic rich region with pores. In these pores sits the methane or whatever the hydrocarbons are, like oil and gas. And then you have other minerals. In this case, you can see the bright minerals. Uh, I believe these are pyrites and you have some, um, some sort of uh, quartz or feldspars and other uh, uh, hard minerals right there. Okay, I don't want to make this a geology class, but uh, you got the idea. There are many ways you're collecting the 3D data set. So how do we segment those? Now, uh, like I mentioned, why do we need to work with 3D unit if you can segment one 2D slice at a, uh, at a time? Let me just show you a few XRM images or X-ray microscope images. Here, there is a fiber reinforced, uh, some sort of a material where you see fibers are or, uh, oriented in many directions, right? So there are fibers coming in this way and there are fibers, if you look at the cross section, there are fibers going that way, there are fiber going into the plane. Uh, let's zoom in. There are fibers coming out here, but if you just take a cross section, you just see like these circular cross sections, right? And what if it is not just a cross section this way, if it is at an angle? 
My point here is just by using this, it's uh, you can segment these little ones, but then if you provide some additional context in terms of how that uh, that region looks like on a plane above and a plane below or two planes above or two planes below, depending on your kernel size, that gives you additional information to improve the accuracy of your 3D segmentation. So this is why you need a 3D unit. Now let's look at 2D unit. A 2D unit is basically you have an image that's 572, in this example, 572 by 572. Or in our example from a couple of uh, tutorials ago, we looked at 256 by 256. But what if you have a volume of 256 by 256 by 256 instead of just a plane of 256, right? So that's exactly what we're talking about. You can easily convert a 2D unit into a 3D unit just by uh, uh, extending the dimensions right there. Obviously, computationally, it's going to, uh, you know, the computer will know the difference, but for us, it's uh, it's relatively straightforward to convert your 2D into a 3D unit. How do you do that? Well, let's look at the code that we have written, uh, that we have been using. We have written this two, three tutorials ago, but we have been using it almost in every uh, uh, 2D unit based uh, tutorial. So here we defined a convolution block, encoder block, and a decoder block. I'm not showing the, the building the unit part because there is not much there for us to change uh, uh, between two, 2D and 3D. So when you look at the convolutional block, what is it doing? It's doing two convolutional operations as part of your regular standard unit. And uh, in between, we added batch normalization. That's it. Yeah. So convolution, activation, convolution, activation. And then the encoder block is basically performing the convolutional operation and then max pulling in addition to that. And decoder block, again, we talked this in uh, 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 when we talked about units. All it's doing is uh, convert 2D transpose or upscaling, upsampling, sorry. Uh, either, whichever one you want to use, and then it's concatenating with the features coming from your encoder block, and then runs another convolutional block. Now, we know this, and notice this, the convolution operation here is conv2d, conv2d, yeah? And the encoder block, the max pooling is 2d, with a size of two by two. And here, the conv2d transpose, with a size of two by two and strides two, yeah? So all we need to do to convert that into 3D is change this to conv3D. Keras.layers has conv3D, 3D, just like conv2D. We need to import that and we need to change the filters. I mean, in this case, we are representing just by a single number three. You can also say three by three. If you are using that notation, then here you have to change that to three by three by three. That's what's implied here when you do conv3D. Okay, and then conv3d right there. And max pooling, instead of two by two, we are changing that to two by two by two. That's pretty much it. Same with conv3d transpose. We're changing this to two by two by two. That's pretty, that's it. And then we are all set. Yeah, and the stride equals to two. I, I, I think this is this is it. I mean, once once you understand what's going on right here, we can go ahead and uh, now it's a matter of handling the data, getting the data ready for UNET. So let's jump into the code and have a quick look at the results. So here is the code. And first of all, how is the data organized? I have a single file called 448 images. Uh, each image is 512 by 512. So this is a TIFF stack of 448 images. And another TIFF stack of 448 images that are, uh, that are uh, you know, that we are using uh, actually that we may be using, uh, sorry, <laughs> this is the wrong one. This is the test image that we'll, we'll check out later. My training images are 256 by 256 by 256. So I have 256 images in Z and in X and Y, the size is 256 by 256, right? So this is my training images and my training masks, they are pretty much the same size, right? I mean, they have to be. So that's, the, that's what we have right here. Okay, now jumping into the code, uh, that data is available, by the way, you can just uh, follow this link and you can download all of that data and work through this example if you want. If you have your own images, you would like to annotate them, you can visit appear.com, it's free, go ahead and upload your images, go ahead and paint it, you need a lot of patience to label your images, but once you're done, you're good to go. And while you're there, you can also use the uh, units and others that are available on the platform. So if you don't want to write your own code, go ahead and use that. Okay, moving down. Uh, 
the changes I showed you, that's exactly what I have done here, right? I'm in my convolution block. Instead of con 2D, I'm importing con 3D, max pooling 3D, up sampling 3D, con 3D tra transpose. So once I have those, uh, I don't even need max pool 2D, right? I can delete that. So we are using con 3D, con 3D. I made all the changes here, max pooling 3D, and uh, two by two by two, con 3D transpose. Rest of it should be exactly the same. I haven't changed anything down here, in fact. There's no need to change any of that. Number of classes, activation is activation. Everything is exactly the same as last time. So let's go ahead and run these. And uh, now move down and let's build the model. So the plan here is my input images are 256 by 256 by 256. I cannot load all of that into the memory at the same time. It's too big. So I am dividing these into patches of 64 by 64 by 64. So I'm dividing my large volume of 256 into smaller volumes of 64, 64, 64, and training the model, load the next volume, train the model, and so on. OK, so that's the plan here. So I'm building a unit with a size of 64 by 64 by 64 and channels three, meaning I'm loading them as color channels. Why am I doing that even though my images are grayscale? So in case for those of you working with color images, you know how to deal with this. Yeah, so 64, 64, 64 by three. You can work with multi-channel images. For example, if you're working with BRATS dataset, I think it's a brain uh, uh, scan images, you can actually combine multiple channels into single. So let's say you have uh, four different channels. Yeah, you can combine all those into single single image and then make this 64, 64, 64 by four because then you have four channels. So you can work with multi-channel, multi-dimensional images. So for now, let's keep this to 64 by 64 by 64, X, Y, and Z, and then three channels. And number of classes equals to four in my case. So let's print out my model. So it has to, oh, all it's doing is printing activation function that it's using, which is softmax. Well, it's multi-class classification, so it's doing that. Let us go ahead. Oh, I'm, I have it down here. Sorry about that. I didn't check. I was about to print the summary. Let's print the summary. So you can see up here, 64, 64, 64, and all the way to the end, it should be 64, 64, 64 by four. Why four? We have four classes. This is multi-class classification. Okay, so far so good. By the way, if you wonder uh, what is the input shape, what is the output shape? I hope you know how to how to uh, write that, right? So what did we call this? My model dot input underscore shape. So go ahead and print it. It should be 64 by 64 by 64 by three. So if you have any questions about how to do that, there you go. Now let's uh, uh, install Patchify. We talked about this again in the past. Patchify is a library that I love uh, that you can use to chop your large images into smaller images. It works for 2D or 3D. That's why I'm importing it right here. So go ahead and pip install. And the uh, TensorFlow and Keras version I'm working uh, right now is 2.5, just in case you wonder. And uh, it's using GPU. Again, all of these sanity checks. Now let's go ahead and import the libraries that we are going to use. Well, I haven't installed patchify i'm not gonna i think i should probably import it let me show everything in a proper way okay so it's installing patchify and then let's run this to make sure it is indeed the same and then is it finding the gpu yes it is and now hopefully all the libraries should be imported useful libraries and uh, uh, here I am mounting the drive for whatever reason. So in fact, in the latest, uh, in the, uh, okay, let's, uh, the reason it's, it's doing this is uh, I imported this notebook from someone else's, I mean, from my account, but some other account. So it's asking me for authorization code. But again, as long as you, uh, as long as you, uh, mounted this drive you should be uh, let me go ahead and stop this as long as you mount this drive you should be fine yeah go ahead and mount this uh and it's saying uh, run this cell to mount it and it's saying okay uh go to this url let me finish this let me pause the video finish this task because i really want to show you on real data and not talk in a theoretical way okay so let me pause this
Okay, so finally it's mounted, yeah? And uh, let's go ahead and continue this. Okay, so now I have access to my drive and all the data in my drive uh, right there. So let's go ahead and read our image. The image is again the 256 by 256 by 256 dot tiff, which is uh, that one, and then the mask. Okay, so let's come here. Let me, and then run this. So it's reading the image and then applying Patchify to divide that image, my 256, 256, 256, into 64, 64, 64 with a step size of 64, okay? And it's doing exactly the same to my patches right there. So if I go ahead and uh, I, don't know, I should have actually plotted one after the other, but just show the images and let's copy this and create another cell so we can see both at the same time so there you go both of these are matching so that tells me again we are on the right track yeah it's very important to check these okay so let's reshape our input images uh, to the right format up to this point they are not in the right format so let's reshape them so they are in the format of 64 by 64 by 64 images and looks like we have too many 64s here this 64 is the total number of volumes that we have and each volume is 64 64 64 that's it okay now number of classes equals to four and convert my gray images to three channels apparently somewhere in the middle i converted my images uh, yeah this is i'm reading this as uh, as a uh, uh, these images are grayscale images yeah and by the way i said sorry to confuse i'm that's not the idea the, you see the input shape here, 64, 64, 64, 3. That means it's expecting color volumes, RGB volumes. That's what I defined because I thought some of you may be working with color uh, RGB volumes, which means in my case, my images are grayscale. They're all grayscale images. I'm not surprised that it showed 64 images, each image 64, 64, 64, 64. but I want each image to be 64, 64, 64, 64 by three, three channels. To do that, I'm just copying my channel three times. And then I'm dividing my volume by 255 to normalize the pixel values and expanding the dimensions. Very standard steps. And then for my masks, I'm converting them to categorical. We have done this in the last few videos, uh, uh, to converting to categorical using four classes. And finally, dividing all of my masks and images into X-Train and X-Test. So this, this is again, no tricks there. Very straightforward. The only, if you want, call, if you call it trick, is uh, here where I'm just converting my single channel image into three channel RGB image, uh, just by copying the same image three times. Or and I'm actually stacking the NumPy arrays to simulate an RGB image. If you already have an RGB image, obviously you don't have to do this, right? Okay. Uh, am I using this dice coefficient? Uh, let's see. Model dot compile. Uh, dice coefficient loss. Okay, so let's go ahead and cover this. Uh, so far, we have been using uh, for you know accuracy as our metric, and uh, for our loss function, we used uh, cross entropy, categorical or binary cross entropy, right? So here, I'm defining a new function called dice coefficient. Yeah. Please do online search on what dice coefficient is. Okay, this can be. Uh, that's a separate tutorial by itself, but uh, I'm defining a dice coefficient. What it does is it takes your true and predicted values and then it performs uh, it performs this operation that I'm actually uh, showing here. Think of dice coefficient as very similar to intersection over union. It is a better metric telling me exactly how my, uh, uh, my uh, predicted segmentation matches the expected segmentation. That's what a dice coefficient is. And I am also defining something called dice coefficient loss because I don't want to use accuracy. Sorry, I don't want to use uh, a categorical cross entropy as loss function. I want to use dice coefficient as loss function. How do you do that? All I'm doing is I took the dice coefficient and I did one minus that. Why one minus that? Because dice coefficient is like intersection over union. We want to maximize the dice coefficient. We want 100% uh, you know, intersection over union. But loss, the optimizer is minimizing the loss. So all I'm doing is just one minus that. Okay, so we are minimizing that. That's it. 
Okay, so let's uh, run these. And if this is confusing, again, you can you can save this topic for future and just use categorical cross entropy and accuracy. It should work. I'm just including uh, you know these uh, for this exercise. That's it. And uh, for optimizer, let's use uh, Adam optimizer and uh, with a learning rate of 0 0.301. And uh, my path size is 64, number of channels is three, right? So we, we, we are kind of simulating this image as RGB. So let's build our model. So my model is path size, which is 64 by 64 by 64 by three, and number of classes equals to three. So, uh, sorry, number of classes is four. Okay, there you go. And now let's go ahead and compile the model using our Adam optimizer. That's what we defined there and dice coefficient loss as the loss function and for the metric dice coefficient yeah so let's go ahead and import that and now you can see this is the model that we are going to use all the way so we should have 64 64 4 at the end okay and 90 million parameters to train and uh, again here is where you can see what our input shape is 64 64 3 our x train shape and all that stuff so so far so good now we can go ahead and train it just like we train any other model x train y train your batch size and number of epochs and your validation data i have already done that and what did i get i got a accuracy not accuracy right we are following dice coefficient so it's not reporting accuracy but dice coefficient 93 percent is an excellent dice coefficient i should say and i saved the model and the loss, not bad, still getting better. Maybe I could have gone 20, 30 epochs more to get a bit more accuracy, but I stopped it right there. So let's go ahead and load the model and try to segment some of the test images. So let's go ahead and predict on our text test data set. And while that's running, let me just quickly provide you uh, a quick summary here. All we have done to convert our 2D to 3D is change our conv and max pooling and con 2D transpose, all uh, of those into 3D, that's it. We have our model ready. Now the, that we have our model ready, we defined that our input is uh, going to be 64 by 64 by 64, and we used Patchify to divide our 256 by 256 by 256 into these smaller volumes, and then we did this. Now, you can, save these smaller volumes if, if you have much bigger data set yeah you can save the smaller volumes to your local directory and use data augmentation that we talked in the previous tutorial to load your data in batches you can always do that okay here i'm just fitting everything into the memory that's it so once you have it now let's go ahead and look at the shape the shape here is i have seven images each image 64 64 64 and i have seven tests i mean these are all for predictions right so this is for my prediction this is my test and the values the unique values are 0 1 2 3. why 0 1 2 3 because we are using argmax to convert our categorical back to our uh, uh, integer encoded okay so now let's see our intersection over union values and they are coming up to 79 percent that's not bad actually 79 percent on this 3d data set and let's go ahead and uh, test some random images so there you go and then plot it i'm again plotting a random plane so right there that's not much to see there in fact i like my prediction better than the label because the label is labeling something there i don't see much of anything going on over there but let's plot some something else not bad not bad and I'm trying to see a, uh, an image where you have a lot of things going on. Maybe this one is fine. So it's almost identical between these two. Yeah. So you can see how easy it is to segment a larger, uh, you know, a, uh, to perform a 3D unit segmentation. But the real fun is segmenting a large data set. Now that I trained it using 64 by 64 by 64, what if I want to apply this to my larger volume of 448 images, each 512 by 512? Yeah, so now I have a really big data set. Well, not really big, but big enough data set that I need to segment. So 
I am uh, uh, segmenting this. I'm sorry. I'm uh, predicting that by first loading my large data set of 448 images, each 512 by 512, using Patchify to divide that into 64 by 64 by 64 patches. And then that basically means I have 7 by 8 by 8. If you multiply 7 with 8 and 8, you get 448. So that many, uh, no, you will not get 448 because we are dividing this into 512, 512 also into 64 by 64 by 64. So either way, I have these many patches of 64 by 64 by 64. Now it's a matter of for each of these patches, for each of these patches, go ahead and predict. That's all I did down here. Yeah, for each of these, just first of all, these patches are all grayscale. So I need to convert them into R in a way RGB. The way I chose to do that is np.stack, which is exactly what we did for training. And then divide by 255, which is our scaling, expand the dimensions, predict the model, get the argmax, and then uh, uh, and then you have your predicted patches. And then I, uh, what do I get at the end of this? 448 patches of size 64 by 64 by 64. And then I am reshaping it into our original shape, which is seven by eight by eight. And now I'm unpatchifying it to put them back into original shape of 448 images of 512 by 512. Okay. So, uh, and, and uh, uh, please stay tuned until the last of this video because I want to show you a cool 3D visualization of our segmented data. So, uh, now I convert that into uh, my image right there until that point is int 64. We don't need int 64. I converted that into unsigned integer 8. Okay, and then I saved it into a TIFF file. So, uh, using the library called TIFF file right there. Again, we use these in the past, so I'm not spending too much time. These are all straightforward, but this is okay. But the problem here is this TIFF file has 448 images and each image has pixel values of 0, 1, 2, and 3. This is okay. I mean, uh, the volume. What's more cool, I should say, or useful, is if you save these into multi-channel 3D volume. What do I mean by that? Hey, uh, a pixel values with the value of zero, the class with the value of zero is saved as a separate channel, one separate channel, two separate channel, and so on. So I'll show you the advantage of doing that. And the way you do that is basically I'm taking my, uh, my volume right there. Uh, I think I call that reconstructed image, right? Yeah, reconstructed image. And if my pixel value equals to zero in reconstructed image, assign that to segment zero. Similarly, segment one, two, three. And then I am, uh, 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 basically I'm creating four volumes, one for each of these classes. And then I'm combining them into a single volume using a pure OMTF library. Go ahead and install it here, you know, uh, and, uh, and uh, go ahead and put these volumes together. And when you do that, the shape of the final segmented volume is going to be this way. The first one represents the time. You can have multi-dimensional, like three-dimensional time series images, multi-channel time series. That's why the first represents the time. The next one is Z. How many Zs we have? 448 Zs. How many channels do we have? Four channels right there. This is a segmented volume with four classes, right? Zero, one, two, three. So we have four channels. Each is 512 by 512 size image. So this is the image that we have created and we saved it right there. And how do you visualize multi-channel images? You can use Zen. If you are a Zeiss user, you already have Zen Blue, for example. You can open this image right there. You can open that in image J, but it doesn't look that cool. You can upload this to appear.com, which I did. Let's go ahead and click on this image. And uh, by the way, uh, if you want Zen Lite, which is the free version of Zen, you can also download this. If you really want a software for your uh, Windows desktop, you can go ahead and download that and use it. And Zen Lite has a lot of image processing functions and it makes it easy for you to work with multi-dimensional files. Uh, also, appear.com, free. Go ahead and uh, let's uh, adjust the range. You see how I have four channels right there? And let's go ahead and adjust the range so we can see these uh, 2D slices. So right now, this is 
Z stack, which means I have many of these in Z direction. Yeah. Multi channel. I have channel one. I can turn this channel on and off. This is why it's useful. You can turn these, uh, for example, the blue channel is all just way too much. So let's go ahead and turn these channels off and only look at one channel right there. And let's convert this to yellow so it looks a bit prettier uh, compared to white. So let's go ahead and do that. And oh, let's do that and change it to yellow. And uh, if, you, if you don't want to just only look at uh, the 2D, you can always switch to 3D view. Again, whatever I'm showing you, this works on any any browser. This is a browser based, you know, uh, this is browser based right here, what you're seeing. Let's actually decrease the size right here. And now you can look at the distribution of different, uh, different regions right there. We can only look at how my red is distributed in the image by turning others off. Again, you can do this on your phone if you want. This is a browser based, uh, like I already mentioned. So yellow probably is better if we look at only that. So this is where how the pyrite is distributed in your uh, in your data set. This is all on a peer. Again, go uh, sign up for a peer free account. Like I already mentioned, you can um, use it for visualization and you can also use it uh, to do uh, various machine learning tasks. So let's jump back. Uh, the final story here is 3D unit is not as scary as you probably thought. 3D unit is defining a 3D unit is very simple and getting the data into order Hopefully you know how to work with NumPy arrays so you can get these uh, 3D patches and uh, you can stop at segmenting the image uh, and getting a 3D segmented uh, uh, you know, uh, image like a volume. But if you really want to perform some analytics, like what is the size distribution of all the regions that have a pixel value of zero or one or two, a better way of doing those uh, or to handle your data is by dividing them into individual segments. By the way, we did exactly the same way back when we did uh, random forest based uh, image segmentation. We kind of uh, separated that into multi-channel, but that was 2D. This is an actual 3D. Okay, so that uh, turned out to be a longer video than I anticipated, but I hope you found this to be useful. So please go ahead and like this video and subscribe to this channel. Thank you.